Welcome to online worship at Centenary United Methodist Church. We're glad you chose to be with us wherever you are. May you experience the presence of the risen Christ. God bless you. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to Centenary United Methodist Church. We're glad you're here. Happy Mother's Day to all you mothers out there. Thank you very much for your service. If you guys are ready, let's stand. Let's open our service this morning with music. Let's open our hearts. Let's open our minds. Let's go close to this morning and walk with Christ. Let's sing 10,000 reasons.
Day to those, and happy Ladies' Days to those who might not be. But it's great to see you all this morning. Uh, Pastor Van is out on a road trip to New York this, this weekend. Uh, his son Gabe got his master's degree yesterday from Syracuse. So that means Pastor Michael is next door running the whole show. So I get to help him out this morning. A couple of announcements to look at this morning. Uh, I see preschool is going to go and enjoy some barbecue again. It is. Uh, do enjoy barbecue. Uh, there's no youth group tonight. I did Mother's Day, and Miss Dora has a special announcement. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, morning. We have got our annual children's choir musical coming up next weekend. It's called In the Image. We are super, super excited to put that on for you. It's going to be this Friday night. And then Sunday morning at the 9 o'clock and 11 o'clock services. So we hope to see all of you there. And please bring friends and family. These kids deserve a big crowd and a lot of support. I got to see it yesterday and how to dress rehearsal at sound rehearsal and everything. Oh, those kids are, yeah, you're going to be blessed by coming to see it next weekend. Uh, feast this week. Uh, yes, we're back to our meatloaf. Uh, meatloaf, mashed potatoes, and gravy with green beans. So come enjoy with us at 5 o'clock. Um, and also look for our uh, next, you remember Sunday next week, if you want to join, please uh, contact the office. And the job opportunities, uh, Marshall is retiring at the end of the month, uh, and we're looking for a second one as well. So uh, please look at your bulletin if you know of anybody that's interested. Pass it along. Are there any other announcements that I'm not aware of? Let's go to the bulletin for now. <coughs> Lord, we thank you for this. Today and the opportunity to come into your house to worship again. Celebrate those who are special in our lives that we call mothers. And those in our lives that we have that are mothers next to us. There's so many. So Lord, we thank you for uh, just the opportunity to honor the women in our lives. As we continue our worship this morning, Lord, uh, fill us with your spirit through the songs we sing. Father, we thank you, we love you, in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand and we'll continue our service.
No, we're not going to take that message from you yet. <laughs> we got the announcements done. These folks are ready to go. We'll play one more and we'll go with that. Good to see this one. All right. Go on. Ready? Let's go where I belong. Center Club. 
Clyde Shell, who is having back surgery tomorrow. So we lift you up and we pray that God and the Spirit are there in your midst tomorrow. Are there other prayer concerns that we can share in the congregation today? Well, let us go to the Lord in prayer. Now, friends, let us offer ourselves to God and our gifts for the ministries of Jesus Christ.
Is today a special day? Yeah, have you done amazing things for the ladies in your life? Yes. I'm sorry, what was that? Is that for the, for the folks in the back? Can you say something? Are you keeping it a secret? That's cool. We'll talk about it later. Uh, today at Children's Church, we are going to talk all about and get excited about uh, the gifts that God has so graciously blessed us with. Specifically, we are going to talk about the Holy Spirit. That sometimes is a hard thing for us to define, right? Um, and I like to think of the Holy Spirit a bit like the breeze. Can you guys see the breeze? Can you see the wind? Nope. Can you feel it though? Yeah, you can definitely feel it. And you can see it move around you, right? You can see how it blows the trees. You can see the movement that it causes. And so I kind of think of the Holy Spirit like that. He is this amazing gift from God who is a comforter to us and who lives with us and in us and moves us. And so we're going to talk about that. But before we leave, we have to shout out our mamas. Hi, and our baby mamas and our nanas. So you guys want to share with us what you love best about your mom or your grandma or aunts or nanas. I'm going to make you, I'm make each one of you, I'm give me something. I enjoy eating bread. Oh, she does. We love her. My mom is the best candy in the house. Oh my goodness, Huggies are the best. What you got? Um, um, my mommy let me eat toys. Oh, we love mommy so much. We've got a binky in our mouth, so we're going to talk about that. All right, let's join us in a quick prayer, okay? God, even though we can't see you, you, we know that you are real. We also know the Holy Spirit is real. Thank you for the comfort you bring us through your gifts of the Holy Spirit and our mamas and nanas and all the women in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Midwives feared God 
they did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but they let the boys live. So the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this and allowed the boys to live? The midwife said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwives come to them. So God dealt with them, God, so God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and became very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. Then Pharaoh commanded his people, Every boy born that is born to the Hebrews, you shall throw into the Nile, but you shall let every girl live. Now a man from the household of Levi went and married a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw that it was a fine baby, she hid him three months. When she could know, when she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and plastered it with pithom and pitch. So she put the she put the child in it and placed it among the reeds on the bank of the river. Her, his sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. The daughter of Pharaoh came down to the river to, to bathe at the river, while her attendants walked beside the river. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her maid to bring it. When she opened it, she saw the child. He was crying and she took pity on him. This must be one of the Hebrews' children. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and get a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Yes. So the girl went and called the child's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child and nurse it for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed it. When the child grew up, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter and took him as her son. She named him Moses because, she said, I drew him out of the water. Okay, now it's time for the reading of the gospel. Would you please stand? <coughs> Today's gospel reading comes from John 19, verses 25 to 27. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister. Mary, the wife of Clovis, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to her, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. From that, from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thank you, God. Please be seated. I want to share with you, whoa, <laughs> I want to share with you some real excuses that were written by mothers for their children. My son is under a doctor's care and should not take PE today. Please execute him. <laughs> Please excuse Roland from PE for a few days. Yesterday he fell out of a tree and misplaced his hip. John has been absent because he had two teeth taken out of his face. <laughs> Please excuse Ray Friday from school. He has very loose bowels. But. Please excuse Jimmy for being. It was his father's fault. <laughs> there was a four-year-old and a six-year-old, and they presented their mom with this beautiful house plant one Mother's Day. It was beautiful. It was a, it was a great house plant. And the mother was thrilled. But the older daughter confessed, Mom, there was another plant that we really wanted to give you. In fact, it was a beautiful bouquet of flowers. And it was so pretty, but it was just out of our price range. We weren't able to get it. And the mom said, that's just fine. I love this. But she said, really, we wanted to because you're always saying how you could just find some rest and peace. And, and we found this one, and it had a sign on there. Sure enough, it said, rest in peace. <laughs> Friends, we pretty much know who Moses was, but we don't know a lot about his family. And that's going to change a little bit today. Moses lived 3,500 years ago during a time period where the Hebrews were enslaved in Egypt. Now, even though the Hebrews were the primary source of labor for the Egyptians, helping them build their magnificent temples and palaces, Pharaoh had decided that there were just too many of them. They had an immigration problem in Egypt, if you will. But Pharaoh decided that he would take the male babies that were being born 
and put them to death. Of course, this would mean after a few years there would be no more Hebrews and no more slave labor and thus no more building projects. But those who decide to exterminate God's people always seem to have, seem, seem to have some kind of sickness and be possessed with some kind of insanity. Just think of Hitler and the lunatic plans that he had to wipe Jews off the face of the earth. And that is just the kind of insane, hateful, dangerous world into which Moses was born. But Pharaoh hadn't planned on a single mother's love. A woman named Jochebed, we learn her name in Exodus 6. Jochebed had already given birth to two babies who were growing up now. And then she gave birth to a boy. And this new baby boy fell under the death sentence of Pharaoh. But she wouldn't simply hand him over and let him be delivered and drowned and, or eaten by crocodiles. She made a waterproof basket for this baby. And she put him in it carefully, covered him, probably said a prayer as she put him into the Nile River. She had faith that God would take care of her baby. Her daughter Miriam, who's probably nine or ten years old, watched to see what was going to happen with the basket. And she witnessed the Pharaoh's daughter finding the basket and showing pity on the infant as she boldly stepped out of the reeds. She asked the Egyptian princess if she would like a Hebrew nursemaid for the baby. And the princess said yes. Miriam must have been over the moon. And she ran to get her, her mother, the baby's true mother, Jochebed. So Jochebed's prayers were answered. And she got to help raise her own son in the Egyptian palace, right in the midst of all of God's enemies. Her faith and her courage saved the nation, for her son became a great deliverer of Israel. And we know his name, Moses. But I bet you didn't know his mother's name until this morning, did you? That's how often it can be with mothers. Mothers can sometimes seem to be invisible. I'm going to share a story as one mother puts it this morning. She writes, it all began to make sense. The blank stares, the lack of response, the way one of the kids would walk into the room while I was on the phone and ask to be taken to the store. Inside, I'm thinking, can't you see? I'm on the phone. Obviously not. No one can see if I'm on the phone or cooking or sweeping the floor or even standing on my head in a corner because no one can see me at all. I'm invisible. The invisible mom. Some days I'm only a pair of hands and nothing more. Can you fix this? Can you tie that? Can you open this? Some days I'm not a pair of hands. I'm not even a human being. I'm just a clock to ask, what time is it? I'm a satellite guide to answer, what channel, what number is the Disney Channel on? I'm a car order to boss around. I need you right around 5.30, please. I was certain that these were the hands that once held books and the eyes that studied history and the mind that graduated summa cum laude. But now they had disappeared into the peanut butter, never to be seen again. She's going, going, gone. And so friends, this morning we considered Jochebed, the mother of Moses, the invisible woman, if you will. As I mentioned, Moses was her third child. Her firstborn was Aaron. Aaron would go on to become a high priest for God's people. Her second child was Miriam, the one who watched Moses floating away on the Nile. Miriam was a gifted poet and is called a prophet in the Bible. Has any mother in history raised three more important children than than Jochebed did with Miriam, Aaron, and Moses. I like what Hebrews 11:23 has to say about Jochebed. 
By faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born because they saw that he was no ordinary child, and they were not afraid of the king's edict. Jochebed wasn't afraid. She trusted God. Jochebed has two qualities that faithful women of God possess. First, she had great respect for human life. She had an overpowering desire to protect and preserve the lives of her children. Consider her desire in a world where children are raised as sex slaves, in a world where children are used in sweatshops as slave labor, where children are used as bargaining chips in divorce, where children are used as punching bags by frustrated parents or siblings, where children are thrown away like garbage. Jochebed understood that children are a gift from God, a gift to be welcomed, adored, protected, cherished, even at a great risk to one's own life. I wonder how often Moses thought of his mother as the years passed. There's no indication she was still alive when he led the people out of Egypt, through the Red Sea, right up to the very edge of the Promised Land. She was long gone, probably, when Moses came down from the mountain with the laws of God. Her bones lay in an unmarked grave in a land where she and her people had been slaves. Do you think she ever wished she could see him now? That she could see Aaron and Miriam and how they all turned out despite the tremendous obstacles? What do you think? Does it matter what kind of start you get in life? No one can ever escape the embrace of a loving mother. Even after she's gone, her teaching and training guide us on a path that we, we've just got to follow. How, pow how powerful are memories of a godly mother? Jochebed had two qualities of a godly woman. One, the respect for human life, and two, a contagious faith in God. Remember that Pharaoh's daughter raised Moses as her very own son. She gave him a name. She gave him an education and all the wealth and grandeur that could come in Egypt. Surely she too had contributed to making him the man that God wanted him to be. Yet despite being surrounded by an Egyptian culture, Moses refused to become an Egyptian prince. His loyalty to his people and later to his God was a testimony to the spiritual truths that he had learned from his mother. Think of all the time she had with Moses. She probably sang with him. Later, she may have told him about her people, stories of Adam and Eve, of Abraham and Sarah, of Jacob and Joseph. Slowly but surely, he learned who he was and who his people were and what their destiny was. Respect for life, contagious faith in God. Women, mothers, grandmothers, aunts, sisters, daughters, teachers, do you realize the influence that you can have over those in your care? And not just children. Let me go back to the invisible woman that we were talking about earlier, the one who said she felt like no one could see her, that she wasn't even human. She continues her story. One night there was a group of us having dinner celebrating the return of a friend from England. Janice had just gotten back from a fabulous trip and she was going on and on about the hotel she stayed at. I was sitting there looking around at all the others put together so well. It was hard not to prepare myself and feel sorry. Feel sorry for myself. I was feeling pretty pathetic when Janice turned to me with a beautifully wrapped package and said, I bought you this. I opened it. It was a book on the great cathedrals of Europe. I wasn't exactly sure of why she'd given it to me until I read her inscription that said, 
to my dear friend, with admiration for the greatness of what you are building when no one sees. In the days ahead, I would read, no, devour the book, and I would discover what would become for me four life-changing truths after which I could pattern my own work. Number one, no one can say who built the great cathedrals. We have no record of their names. Number two, these builders gave their whole lives for a work which they would never see finished. Number three, they made great sacrifices and expected no credit. Number four, the passion of their building was fueled by their faith that the eyes of God saw everything. A legendary story in this book told of a rich man who came to visit the cathedral while it was being built. And he saw a workman who was carving a tiny bird on the inside of a beam. And he went up and asked the man, why would you be carving such an intricate, beautiful bird in a place where nobody would see it? And the workman replied, because God will see it. I close the book, she writes, feeling the missing piece fall into place. It was almost if I had heard God whispering to me, I see you. I see the sacrifices that you make every day, even when no one else around you does. No act of kindness you could have done, no sequin you could have sewn on, no cupcake that you have baked is too small. <coughs> For me to notice and smile over. You are, a build, you are building a great cathedral, but you can't see right now what it will become. At many times, my invisibility feels like an affliction, but it's not a disease that's erasing my life. It's a cure for the disease of my self-centeredness. It's the antidote to my strong, stubborn pride. I keep the right perspective when I see myself as a great builder as one of the people who will show up at a job that they will never see finished, to work on something that their name will never be on. The writer of the book went on to say as far as, to say that no cathedrals could ever be built in our lifetime today because there are so few people that are willing to sacrifice to that kind of degree. When I really think about it, I don't want to tell my son or my son to tell the friend that he's bringing home from college for Thanksgiving. I don't want him to tell that friend that my mom gets up at four o'clock in the morning to bake pies on Thanksgiving and that she bastes the turkey for three or four hours and that she presses all of the linens for the table before we sit down to eat. That would mean that I'm building a shrine or a monument to myself. I just want him to come home and then if there's anything more to say to his friend to add, you're going to love it there. As mothers and as fathers, we are building great cathedrals. We cannot be seen if we're doing it right. And one day it's very possible that the world will marvel not only at what we've built, but the beauty that has been added to the world by the sacrifices of invisible women. Amen. We never know in this life what our finished products will turn out to be because of our perseverance. And so friends, it is for mothers. It is for those of faith. On this Mother's Day, may I suggest to you that this is a heritage that we owe to our children, to our families, to those closest to us. Never shrink from your responsibility for letting God shine through your life into the hearts of your children, your husband, your family. You may be thinking, but you don't know my situation. That's true. I don't. We don't. But we all know what Jochebed's situation was now. And as awful as her life in Egypt was, she overcame all the obstacles with God's help. And you can too. For the God that she served in is the same yesterday, 
the same today and the same tomorrow. Amen. Friends, I'll invite you to stand as we go back into worship and singing. Spend time with our, our uh, significant others and mothers instead. Um, and also, New Member Sunday, if you're interested in joining the congregation, uh, it's going to be on May 21st. And if you're interested in joining, please contact either Pastor Van or myself or the church office this week. Uh, now, let us uh, take an opportunity to greet those around us as we begin to uh, wind up into a circle for our closing benediction.
Let's join together. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Thank you for joining us in worship today at Centenary United Methodist Church. If you'd like to know more about Centenary, go to www.centenarychurch.com. If you'd like to speak to me or another staff member, you can reach us at 252-637-4181. Or if you'd like to visit us, come to 309 New Street in beautiful Newburn, North Carolina. God bless you, and remember, God loves you. <laughs>